Well, hello and welcome back to our We Are One series. In this series, we are talking about the things that make us one. As a church, we want to not just be one in name, but we want to be one in heart and soul. As Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. And so in this series, we're talking about the things that make us one. And in the last session, I shared with you our vision as a church, that our vision is to be a family of Jesus followers, changing the world by making disciples from neighborhoods to nations. And today I wanna start to talk to you about our values, the four core values that define who we are as a church family. You know, everybody has values, whether they recognize it or not. Uh, Every family has values. Uh, Every uh, community organization has values. Every nation and culture has values. Uh, If you go overseas, sometimes you see the things that are distinct in each culture, all of the beauty and diversity. And we see the external things, but we often don't realize that it's actually underlying values that shape the culture. And that's true uh, for us as a church, that uh, the ideals and the ideas that we hold dear shape our, uh, our culture, our ethos, our values. Our values are the things that make us, us. Uh, not that we're trying to be distinct from anybody else, but we just want to have clarity of what are our values as a church? What are the things that we are rallying around? What are the things that uh, determine the why behind the what of what we do? And so as we're thinking about values, though, of course, as a church, uh, we don't want them to just be my values or even just our values as people. We ultimately, we want them to be kingdom values, values that represent the kingdom of God. And and ultimately, we want them to be Jesus's values. And so I want to look at a passage of scripture throughout the upcoming sessions that will help us to clarify the values that Jesus calls us into as followers of Christ. And so I want to look at this passage of scripture in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Here's what the Bible says. And he went up on the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now here we find the account of Jesus calling his first followers, uh, the, the ones that he would pour his life into and ultimately the ones who would become the apostles that would be the founders of the church, the kind of the founding fathers, of course, following Jesus. But this is the account that he is calling them and they are beginning to form into a community. And, and I believe that this is a significant passage for us uh, to understand and to be shaped by as followers of Jesus. Or, or we could say it this way, that I, in these verses, I believe these verses contain the DNA of discipleship. And that's what we want to gather around and that's what we want to shape the values of who we are as a church. And so today I want to speak to you about our first value. And I want to draw your attention to verse 13 in that passage. It says this, he went up on the mountain. He, Jesus, went up on the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted and they came to him. He went up on the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted and they came to him. And that verse really Uh, encapsulates the essence of the thing that I want to draw your attention to as our first core value, and that is the value of presence. The value of presence, uh, ultimately the value of the presence of God, but learning to be present with God and learning to encounter the presence of God. I want to just draw your attention to these phrases. The Bible says that he went up on the mountain and he called to him, He called to him. And that really is the starting point in the life of a disciple or follower of Jesus. It is first a call to Jesus to be with him and to know him as a disciple or a follower of Jesus. We don't want to just know about him. We want to know him. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he said, 
Oh, that I might know him, that I might know him. Uh, the book of Daniel says that those who know their God shall be strong and carry out exploits. Uh, in other words, uh, they will change the world, but it all begins with knowing God. And, and I want us to recognize this, that that is the starting point. That is the beginning. That is the, the springboard from which all of discipleship and all of spiritual life flows is being in the presence of God. That, that is the call of the gospel. You see, when every one of us comes to faith, it, it at its core is an invitation to be with God. That, that although sin has separated humanity from the presence of God, uh, that, that through Jesus Christ, we have been reunited, restored back to relationship with God, back to intimacy with God. You see, the gospel is not just a, a body of doctrine, but it is an invitation to intimacy. And that's what Jesus was sharing with his disciples. He said, it says he went up on the mountain and he called to himself. The gospel is an invitation, a call to Jesus to be with him. He called those he himself wanted. I love that. What a beautiful reality that God has chosen, just as he chose those 12 ragtag, you know, followers. He has, in his kindness and in his grace, he has chosen us. He has wanted us, not because of our goodness, not because of our worth or merit, but because of his goodness. And so the gospel is an invitation, come to him, come to him. But then it also says this, and they came to him. It wasn't just that he called them. There is a calling that, that every one of us uh, hear when we hear the gospel. The call of God is, as uh, theologians call it, the effectual call of God. But there is also our part to play, and that is our responsibility to come to him. And that's what the scripture says. Not only did he call them, but then they also came to him. In other words, they left everything else. Later, the scripture says they left their nets and followed him. They left what was uh, familiar, what was comfortable, and they followed him. They came to him because they found him more beautiful and more compelling and more desirable than anything else. And at its core, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a person of the presence of God. Even throughout all of Scripture, the story of God's people is a people of the presence of God. As Adam and Eve walked with God, walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden, and if we want to be followers of Jesus, it begins first and foremost by learning to pursue the presence of God. We want to be people at home in the presence of God, comfortable with the presence of God, prioritizing the presence of God. But, but how do we do that? Well, I want you to pay attention to where they were, because I think it actually gives us some insight into how we become people of the presence. The Bible says he went up on a mountain. He went up on a mountain and he called to him. You see, a mountain is a picture of nearness to God. A, a mountain is a picture of a, a, a space where heaven and earth meet. Throughout the Bible, we see mountains as a meeting place with God. You, you see, I know for those of us that live in Florida, mountain may be an unfamiliar term. <laughs> we don't have mountains here. But there's something about getting into the mountains. Uh, why do people love to go to the mountains? There's something about that mountaintop experience. You see, when you're at the mountaintop, uh, all of the noise of life, all of the problems of life that seem so big when you're on the ground in the middle of those things. Suddenly, when you get to the mountaintop, those things that used to dominate your attention uh, begin to just drift into the distance. You begin to get clarity when you're at the mountaintop. And that's what happens in the presence of God. We begin to get clarity, the noise of life, the demands of life, all of the things that clamor for our attention in the presence of God, those things uh, just begin to drift into silence. That's what happens when we're at the mountaintop. When we're at the mountaintop, we also can see farther. We can see further than when we're 
on the ground. And that's what happens in the presence of God. When we come into the presence of God, we enter into that mountaintop environment. We come to a, a mountaintop where we can see beyond the place that we're currently at. We can see further in life and the purposes of God for our lives. And it all happens in uh, and on the mountaintop. And that's why throughout scripture, we see again and again, people going to the mountain to meet with God. Uh, the Bible tells us that Abraham went to Mount Moriah and there he worshiped God as he was willing even to sacrifice his own son in an act of worship. Why? Because he, he loved God more than even the promises of God. He wanted the presence of God. He worshiped on the mountain. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus that Moses went to the mountain and God spoke to him on the mountain. That's why ultimately even the temple, the Old Testament temple was built on the mountain. It was a picture of the presence of God, nearness with God, a place where heaven and earth are, are, are close to one another. And that's why we see even in the life of Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus often went away to the mountain to pray. What was he doing? He was getting away from the busyness. He was getting away from all of the demands that, that were creeping in upon him and the, even the demands of ministry. He was going away to be shut off from the world and to be shut up with the Father. And the Bible shows us the, the picture that it's in that place of being alone with the Father in the presence of the Father, that the power is released and restored in the life of Jesus to do the work that God has called him to do. And that's true for every single one of us, that, that in the presence of God, his power is released to fulfill his purpose. Or we could say it this way, men and women who have been to the mountain with God change the world, change the world. Well, what does that mean for us? Does that mean we all need to go to the mountains? Well, I've got some good news. Uh, the Bible tells another story in the book of John chapter four, another conversation about mountains. And it's Jesus talking to the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. And they have this debate over worship styles and worship preferences. And she was a Samaritan. And she said this, you Jews worship on, in Jerusalem on that mountain. But we Samaritans, we worship on another mountain. And Jesus said this, woman, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem because the Father is seeking true worshipers who wor will worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, it's not about a place. It's not about having to go to a physical place, but it's the faith in our hearts that causes us to engage with the presence of God. We could say it this way, God wants us to live in a perpetual mountain top lifestyle. He wants us to live in the mountains. Uh, I, I believe this, that through faith, uh, wherever we turn our hearts towards the presence of God, we can climb the mountain. We can go to that place of the the beautiful vista of seeing the expanse of God's goodness for our lives. But just like climbing a mountain, it takes work. It, it, it takes energy. But the reason people do it is because of the beauty at the top. And the same is true in our lives, that we, uh, through uh, the, the practices of prayer and worship, uh, we engage with the presence of God. And sometimes that feels like work, but we're climbing the mountain. We're climbing the mountain. And the beautiful reality is that when Jesus hung on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn. That veil that separated the presence of God from every person in humanity outside of the high priest, that veil was torn. And God was saying, now my presence is available to you anywhere. You can have a mountaintop moment in your car. You can have a mountaintop moment when you're uh, when, when you're washing the dishes, wherever you turn your heart towards the Lord. But God is looking for people who will first and foremost be people of his presence. And that's our desire as a church. We don't want to be people that just know about God. We don't want to be able to just even recite facts and figures of who God is or theological 
uh, truths, although that is important, but ultimately all of the truth in the word of God is to lead us into a personal relationship with God. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter four that Peter and John, when the people in Jerusalem saw Peter and John, they knew they were uneducated and untrained men, and they knew they had been with Jesus. They knew they had been with Jesus. One church, that's my prayer for you, that, that although we may all have different personalities, we all may worship with different expressions, and we all may pray in different ways, but my desire, my prayer for you and for our church is that we would be people that the world would look at us and say, I think they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. Their faces are shining. They're reflecting the glory of God. So how do we do that? If we want to be people that value the presence of God, how do we do that? Well, I want to share with you three vehicles, practical things that we as a church want to make a part of our regular routine in order to become people of the presence of God. Those three things are prayer, worship, and communion. Three vehicles uh, to move into the presence of God, prayer, worship, and communion. First of all, prayer, prayer. See, prayer is to be the center point, the focal point in the church, in the house of God. Jesus said it this way, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. Notice he didn't say it should be called a house of preaching, although preaching is important. He didn't say it should be called a house of programs, although there may be programs. He didn't say it'll be a house, uh, you know, of entertainment. He said, my house will be called a house of prayer. And I believe that as a church, God is calling us to prioritize prayer in order to pursue his presence. If we want to be people of the presence of God, we've got to be people who learn how to pray. Why? Because prayer is ultimately about relationship with God. It's about relationship with God. Or as Dallas Willard said, prayer is simply talking to God about what we're doing together. And I know that perhaps for some of you, when you hear that, you may feel prayer, that's not really my thing. Well, I, I want you to understand that all of us need to be growing in our prayer life because prayer is simply communication and relationship with God. And so you may not feel today like I'm a person of prayer, but I wanna encourage you to become a person of prayer. And do you know how you become a person of prayer? Pray, by praying. And so we wanna be a people that pray and pray a lot. We wanna pray on our own. We wanna pray in small groups. We wanna pray in large gatherings. We wanna pray with all kinds of prayer. We wanna pray uh, loud prayers like they did in Acts chapter four when they lifted up their voices together. We wanna pray quiet prayers when we're simply being still in the presence of God. We wanna pray uh, thoughtful prayers. And we also wanna pray in the spirit uh, with groanings, as the Bible says, our spirit communing and praying to God beyond what words can even describe. We wanna pray with all kinds of prayer. But I wanna encourage you that we as a church wanna be a people that, that, that practice prayer. We want to pray. We want to pray a lot because we value the presence of God. So, so our first vehicle is prayer. Our second vehicle is worship. Worship. How do we encounter the presence of God? We encounter the presence of God through worship, or we could say praise and worship. Those are terms that the Bible often uses. And to use the imagery of the mountaintop, I believe that praise is the pathway. Praise is the pathway that leads us up to the place where we see the beauty of God, the goodness of God. And worship is simply uh, recognizing the beauty of God's goodness. It's what happens in our hearts when we sit on a mountaintop and we look out and we just say, wow, that's worship. But ultimately, the greatest form of worship is our worship to God. And I know oftentimes when we talk about worship and praise and worship, uh, oftentimes the first thing that comes to our minds is music. And that is a, a, a beautiful and biblical expression of praise and worship. And we want to express the full 
expression of biblical praise and worship. That's singing and, and playing instruments and dancing and clapping and bowing and lifting up our voices. Those are all biblical expressions. Uh, I know we all have different personalities, but that's what the Bible says that is pleasing to the Lord. But ultimately, I think it's important for us to understand that worship is not uh, about a musical style. Worship is not simply music. Music is a beautiful expression of worship, but worship is our heart adoring the goodness of God. You see, worship is not about having good music. Worship is about the goodness of God, the grace of God. And out of that revelation of who God is, we can't help but sing. We can't help but shout. We can't help but, uh, but just love him and adore him. And that is the heart of worship. You see, worship, the root word of worship, our English word for worship, was an old English word, worth-ship. Worth-ship. In other words, it, it, it's his worth. It's his beauty that motivates our worship. And we want to be people that not just have worship services, although we will have times of worship, but we don't want to just have worship services or even just a worship team. Although uh, if you have musical talent and musical gift, we love those things. But ultimately what we want as a church and what God wants as a church is not just worship services. He wants worshipers. That's what Jesus says. The Father is looking for worshipers. And so even in our times of worship, our hope is, our desire is that we would become people that overflow in all of life for worship. And that will become a vehicle that will lead us into the presence of God. So our vehicles are prayer, our vehicles are worship. And then the third thing I want you to see is the vehicle of communion. The vehicle of communion. And I love that Jesus uh, in his uh, humanity gave us a very tangible expression, a tangible physical reminder of what he has done for us when he shed his blood and broke his body upon the cross. And the night before he was betrayed, he took bread, he took wine. He said, this is my body. This is my blood broken for you, shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, there's something in communion, receiving the, the bread and the wine or juice. There's something in that experience that is opening up our hearts to receive and to encounter the presence of God. It, it, the fact is there's actually even within the broader church family, there's those who would believe that the, the bread and the wine actually become the body and the blood of Jesus. And we don't believe that, but we do believe that through faith, there is a, uh, a unique encounter with the presence of God as we receive communion. And so as a church, we want those to be regular uh, rhythms, regular parts of our practice. And of course, schedules will change and seasons will change and styles may change from time to time. But what will never change is that we will be people who love the presence of God, pursue the presence of God, will pursue him in prayer, will encounter him in worship, and will encounter him in communion. And so my desire and my prayer is this, that we would become people of the presence, that we would be people that live all of life in nearness with the presence of God. And when we find the noise, the clamor, the distractions and the difficulties of life creeping in upon us, we would hear that gentle whisper of Jesus inviting us, come to the mountain with me, come be with me. And we would be like his disciples. We would respond and we would say, Jesus, I'm coming to you because life with you is better than life anywhere else. I pray that we will be people of the presence of God. So thank you so much for joining me today, church. I hope you'll join me in the next session as we talk about our second core value. Thank you so much.